Kamhanu Imanai, um, Pathway Recovery African Immigration Resource Support and Networking. And also we have uh, some panel discussions and guest speakers. Inshallah, uh, Marka was Kabalavan and Wahanku Belavan and Aida Koran Krimka, Wahanu Yeria Malin Aden. Allah is the Lord of the Rahim. هل تعالى الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن شيئا مذكورا إن خلقنا الإنسان من نضفة أمشاج نبتليه فجعل له سميعا بصيرا صدق الله العظيم وحن ربا إن شاء الله إنا هدنا أويارو and the key noise speaker uh, Marian Duale um, Marian welcome Marian she was doing this overview of the day agenda introducing of the event and purpose, purpose of the objection. So I would like to welcome to Marion this stage. Thank you for everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Marion Duale. I am the co-founder and executive director of Global Health, Education and Development. Um, I am very grateful that you joined us today, and I apologize if we're running a little bit behind. It's a Saturday, so <laughs> yes, and uh, so today I will just briefly uh, give you an overview of what the event is about. I'll introduce Global Health, Education and Development and myself, and I'll talk about the purpose of the event, the, our funding sources, uh, why we need this event, uh, what's the goal, and who is all here to participate in this resource uh, fair. So as I mentioned, I'm the co-founder and director of Global Health Education and Development, uh, short for GHEAD. GHEAD is a nonprofit organization. It was founded in, back in 2011. Our focus is to improve access to health and education for immigrant and refugee communities. Um, we focus on that because the co-founder and myself were both in this space where we were helping a lot of communities with accessing health care and education and other essential services and we've realized that there's an information gap and that's what drove us to um, um, found this agency and to focus in this area. Um, one of our big programs, I can't go over all of our health and education programs, but one of our uh, main health programs is mental health and substance use and addiction awareness. Um, advocacy, community education, and referral to services. We are waiting for certification to provide uh, direct services, but we do not do that right now. So we enjoy bringing resources together and uh, breaking those resources down for the community and connecting them to those resources. Um, so this event, how many people know that September is the Recovery Awareness Month? By show of hands. Okay, so I'm glad we're here because a lot of people are not aware that September is uh, Recovery Awareness Month. So this event is for that. And the whole idea is to provide awareness about the importance of recovery and to connect people to services that can ensure their success through recovery. So Thank you all for not only being here, but taking the initiative to bring people together. What is important is what we know uh, to be fact is that there is a information gap that allows for a widening array of resources to exist with so many people that are not connected to them. Um, and usually the biggest difference in allowing people to be self-sufficient and to be able to build strong families, allowing for people to be their best selves, is to be able to connect them with information that changes or transforms their lives. And in the aspect in uh, really the reality of addiction recovery and everything else that will be covered here, um, information is so powerful as a key to transforming lives that the best thing you can do is to convene people to then share that information out. And so there are a few dozen people here, but there's a few thousand that because of this convening that are going to be able to access this information moving forward. And so hopefully this is another step in transforming those lives uh, and really bring not only awake, 
not only awareness uh, to recovery, but as well as uh, recovery in action. Um, and so I have the privilege, everyone, of being the recently appointed, though it's not official yet, um, because I don't have a start date yet, but uh, to, to be able to be entrusted by the commissioner of the, of the Ohio African Immigrant Commission uh, to be the inaugural executive director for this agency. Um, and, as, and what I'd like to share is that of Ohio's 50 states and also some territories, there is no other agency at a state level that represents and advocates for African immigrants at a state level. And so everywhere else, and we've, we've researched, and if it's, not, it's wrong, let me know, because I've done the research, um, the Ohio African Immigrant Commission is the only commission at a state level that advocates for African immigrants directly as a constituency at a state level. And so that is something that we are proud of here in Ohio. And it also gives us an opportunity to support efforts like these, both with Global Health Education, Somali Can, and others, to be able to not only bring resources and build their capacity, but also make sure that this information and the good work that they do is both in the governor's ear, having conversations in the legislature, so we can continue to build that effort, continue to add this population, this growing constituency of multifaceted uh, communities in conversations that we otherwise would not be able to have um, in around tables because what we know about policy is that that's where it starts and that's where it ends. And what we know also is that if we are not, and this is something that I've, I've learned uh, that is I think very funny uh, recently from, uh, from a chef, is that if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. We are not going to be on the menu. We are going to be at the table. And so the African Immigrant Commission stands alongside, and I speak for all uh, 10 commissioners, including Commissioner Abdurazak there, uh, that the commission stands alongside you. The commission is a partner in this effort, and this commission will continue to help build your advocacy capacity, as well as being able to make sure that we are representing you where you are not at the state level. Uh, UNIQUE actually stands for United in Khair. For those of you who are not Somali or Arabic speakers, it means United in Good. Uh, we were formed back in 2019. Our focus really was, um, at that stage, was trying to support individuals from the new American and immigrant communities who are just this impacted. Uh, this is a silent epidemic. There are a lot of families, some of them may be here, who are struggling with individuals who are either in county jails or state prison. Um, we really began our journey from that perspective, identifying, working. We have facilitators who go to both uh, state prisons, uh, statewide, where we engage and prepare individuals that are coming out to the communities. Uh, this has been ongoing. We have a partnership with the state prison system. And over the years, what we found is, um, as Mariam mentioned earlier on, Supporting individuals that are coming out is one thing, but what our data has shown is these individuals are also struggling with mental health and substance abuse. Uh, published data shows anywhere between 40 to 50 percent of individuals that are just this impacted uh, suffer from one form of mental health and substance abuse. So since 2000 and I would say 20 minus COVID, uh, we really have focused on providing those support services as individuals come out into the communities. Um, I'm pleased to announce that Unique Foundation is probably one of a uh, few organizations that are fully licensed to provide substance abuse and mental health services. We also provide uh, recovery housing for individuals in the new American communities. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here, not just because of the wonderful individuals who are here, but also the fact that this is an issue that's been taken seriously, not just by the elected officials, but also us as community. The fact that we're starting to realize and trying to overcome stigma means that we are taking serious and we are taking ownership of our own health and the health of our people, okay? Which I would like to congratulate all of you guys. So you, do, you deserve a, a round of applause. Okay. Moving on from there, as the soon-to-be president of the New African Commission mentioned, uh, this is a long war, a long battle. 
You don't, oh, okay. Both or just one? Both. Okay. Can they all hear me at the back? Excellent. Good. Um, I'm not going to say too long, but I want to, again, commend uh, Dr. Sao uh, for taking ownership of that policy scheme. Um, there are fundings um, that are applicable to our communities. Uh, but as he said so eloquently, if you're not at the table, you'll definitely be on the menu. Okay, so it's really important that we advocate for ourselves. It's important that we get the word out there. We get the word out there to community members to be able to say it's okay to talk about substance abuse. It's okay to talk about mental health. I think as individuals from the immigrant communities, um, sometimes we're put in a category which I'm a little bit concerned about, which is model communities. And model community means that you are superhuman and you, you, know, you don't do anything wrong. Um, although that sounds uh, impressive at face value, what it does is that it actually dehumanizes us to a certain extent. It makes us less vulnerable. It makes us um, less susceptible or perceived to be less susceptible to mental health and substance abuse. Um, that in itself needs to be fought. This morning. Um, but again, my name is Don. I'm from Alvis. Um, Alvis is a um, organization that helps out different um, populations. Uh, we have behavior health, we have reentry, we have workforce development, um, development disability programs, and we have family and children programs. Um, I'm here to speak about the behavior health and the um, the behavioral health and the mental health part of what we do. Um, we service um, people coming from prison and we also service people that's about to go to prison. We service state, uh, state people and we service federal people. Um, but we do an array of things. Um, we do alcohol and drug assessments. We do um, mental health assessment, so we do a di dual diagnosis also. Um, but we help a lot of different, we have a lot of different things that we offer. Um, but we're just like a, I guess a 360 uh, company, so we do a lot of different things. Yeah. So y'all can stop by our table. Like I said, I wasn't prepared to speak, I'm nervous. <laughs> but I can speak to you personally, one-on-one -on -one at the table. My name is uh, actually Deba. Deba Wadia. I I make people to remember, I tell you, if you remember day by day, uh, anytime you remember day by day, you remember Deba. And so <laughs> you, can, you, you can always remember my name. I am the publisher of New Americans magazine. I am I'm a journalist. Uh, sometimes you may see me uh, singing, so I'm also an entertainer, so I sing. Uh, but. Um, the, the most essential thing I do is journalism. And so in journalism, you inform, you educate, and also you entertain. So that's what we do. Um, we are online on uh, the New Americans mag.com. I, I was chatting with uh, Mohammed just now of uh, Pro Choice, and he said, Do you have HAP? So that's the next level you know, of publication, where you have your hub. But I'm thinking beyond that, so I won't, I won't have to divulge it here. But um, I, I want to talk about why we are here, uh, which is about mental health. I, I want to thank um, uh, our very soon to be Dr. Mariam Duale. I've been following her since she started, why she w was doing all the research and all the um, um, service uh, in school and um, when she called to inform me about this I said uh, Dr. Jibril had called me and uh, I, I want to um, say a, a few words about Dr. Jibril. Um, I've known him now for about 10 years uh, probably going to 12 years. He's um, someone that is passionate about this community, someone that believe in this community. You know, no matter where you are from, is ready to uh, support, educate, and inform. And so uh, when we started the New Americans Magazine, and we wanted 
editorial advisors. Uh, he was one of the first that uh, I approached. And so he has been part of us since we started the uh, New Americans magazine. Uh, about mental health, it's something that is, you know, very, uh, uh, very important in this uh, community because uh, we know that where we come from, most of us, uh, those of us that come from Africa, I'm from Nigeria. Uh, Ibrahim Asso is the, is going to be the executive uh, director of uh, the new African um, Commission, um, and also he was probably some of you don't know he was a cha he was a chairman at the time of that commission, and so he's um, the right person to put in that commission. All right. And On the twenty second of February this year, uh, there was a news in the in the media of uh, a certain guy Colin Jennings, which was shot by the Columbus police. And after that, they got to know that he was actually struggling with mental health. All right? I'm not here in the gab of uh, an imam, though it's a, a perspective on its own. I'll also be talking as a chaplain, a healthcare chaplain for that matter. I was on a shift someday. This, the Somali community will relate to this, especially those living on the west side. All right? A guy was rushed in in the middle of the night. He was shot by the police. He said he had a gun. Uh, and he, they said he engaged the police. And when I spoke with his parents, after he was declared dead, they said he was struggling with mental health. If you look at it statistically, it is shown that the police are prone to open fire on colored people more than the white. Okay, so what that, what that tells us is that as a colored people, as a migrant struggling with mental health, we are prone to be shot by the police if we have any, maybe, weapon, dangerous or not dangerous. All right, that gets to tell us that the issue of mental health, especially within the migrant community, is something that must be pushed outside by everyone, with every resources, with every avail available uh, uh, channels, okay? Just like uh, Mr. Deba said, the resources are there. Uh, my sister, the doctor-to-be, Marianne Duali, is doing enormous. So many other organizations are doing things like this. It is left for us to just click into it. Okay, that sage said, if you want to, I think he was talking about the black people, that if you want them not to know about any information, put it inside a book. All right? Now, if you do not want us to know about any information, do not click the news channel. How many of us watch the news? How many of us go to just flip into NBC, ABC, CNN? No, because they have things that keeps us busy all the way. All right, the entertainment channel, the TikTok, and every other thing. I'm not saying it's not good, but I'm saying first thing first, our mental health is very, very important, especially for our kids. We, the older generations, we have so many avenues to have our closure and not have depression. For the Muslims, you say, Inna lillahi wa inna is enough for us, right? Once everything happens, you say, God giveth, God taketh. That's it. But our children do not understand this because they were built in here. They know what depression is. If you're an average African, you don't know what depression is. Your father will slap depression out of you. <laughs> okay? But here, it's a case. So we need to treat them according to the system they are built on before they become gunshot victim and everything like that. Resources are out there. As a chaplain, as a healthcare worker, as an imam, as a community leader, I am appealing to everyone. Good morning, and thank you for attending this important event. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the G head, its team, the executive director, Marian Duale, and uh, all participants. Thank you for coming in this Saturday morning. I know there are lots of things that you could have done, uh, but you know, your uh, commitment to 
arrive here this morning and be a part of this event shows that you care and you care about you know people with mental health people who are recovering from substance use um, the intention of this session was to uh, do a, a panel discussion on uh, these issues with uh, people who are at the forefront of providing services and we wanted to go in depth uh, into the issues but the way our room is set up uh, is, is a little bit different so we can't have panelists here we only have one microphone or two uh, so what I'm going to do is to ask specific questions to the uh, service providers the um, people at the forefront I'm going to ask them specific questions so that we can get insights uh, into the work that they do and the challenges that are faced by uh, people dealing with and recovering from mental health and substance use uh, issues. So first I would like to call um, to give us a uh, picture one second. Okay, so um, the question goes this way. How can mental health and recovery services be adopted to account for the cultural, linguistic, and religious differences among African immigrants? And what strategies and initiatives could be implemented to make these services more accessible and effective for African immigrants. That question goes to Regina from NAMI Franklin County. NAMI has lots of resources, trainings, advocacy work, policy work that they do to um, make services accessible and available to communities. And I would like to hear from Regina. Can you come over and? Services be adapted and accounted for cultural linguistics, inclusion, and communication. With the training that we are getting now concerning um, mental health, the majority of the training is said to be communication. If we don't know, we can't help. If you don't include us, um, we can't get, get out there. NAMI is a, a nonprofit that deals with educating, supporting, and advocating for the families and the person that, is, that has a lived condition. If we don't know, we can't help. Um, how can we adapt? As I'm learning, as I'm learning the different certifications, the majority of them is saying communication. If I don't know anything about you when you when I first meet you I can communicate I tell you my story I tell you about me once you learn about me and what I've been through and everything like that then if I don't know about you I can ask and that is what they're, they're emphasizing ask if you don't know but not that I'm asking to be nosy or anything like that because I, I want to, to know your cu culture. I want to be inclusive. I want the different communities to know what is going on out there for mental health. We educate, we have family programs, we have um, mentoring programs, we have support pro programs. When we say families, it don't necessarily mean the mother, the father, the sister, brother. It could be the aunts, the uncles, the next door neighbors. If they, it takes a community. And that community is family. And if you want to know about how can you help the next person, 
take these classes. Understand, because if you don't understand what's going on, what they're dealing with, then you can't help them. And that's what Regina feels that your community can do for the different agencies out here. Our next speaker will address what it takes to be at the table. And he knows both sides of the aisle. He, he has been on the menu, he has also been on the, at the table. <laughs> um, Abdirsaq Ahmed is uh, the director of SABAC, which advocates for um, immigrants and refugees to be part of the policy making processes, electoral processes. He's also a commissioner with the New African Immigrants Commission at the state level. Um, he has worked with refugees and immigrants for a long time. Uh, he was at CRIS as a resettlement case manager and as a employment counselor. So he's somebody that knows both sides of the aisle. Abdi, welcome. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Professor Jibril. Uh, thanks to uh, Jihad and Somalikan uh, putting together this great event that puts resources together. I am the president for Somali American Political Action Committee, but also at the same time, I'm also a commissioner at the New African Immigrants Commission, led by my brother Ibrahim Asal. Uh, one of the challenges that we do believe that the African immigrant community and immigrants at all face is the same words that have been used. We have been so long underrepresented and also underserved. And one of the issues that we thought about it is the only way we can have our issues addressed and the things that are so important to our communities addressed is to be part of the system. And the ways that we can be part of the system is making sure that we do have people that advocate for us on behalf of, of our larger communities. The Somali American Political Action Committee, uh, one of the things they have done is advocate for the community to be part of that system that puts together things that are really important for the community. One of the things that also we do believe that can connect resources to the community with mental health and other resources is making sure that those policies that affect us as a community being addressed, whether it's the state house or whether it's the Senate or whether it's the governor's office. And we do believe that those policies would help us down the road. Unfortunately, not very many of us are educated and aware of the issues that come with mental health. Mental health is a global issue, is a local issue too. But at the same time also, mental health comes in many forms. You might know someone that is having a mental health, but at the same time, it doesn't really show physically because that's why it's mental health. A person will look to you so good, but at the same time, that person may be going through you know, issues that it's not easy for any one of us to identify. I wanted to begin the discussion with um, a question. Um, with uh, to Nafisa Jamale from the Bakai Ranch. Is Nafisa here? Okay, Nafisa. Okay. So Nafisa works at the Bakai Ranch. Uh, the Bakai Ranch is a mental health and substance use organization that focuses on working with um, youth, with young people. They have outpatient services. They also have residential services. I had the privilege of working at the Bakai Ranch back in the day, many years ago. It was the first mental health agency to begin a Somali program that works with Somali youth in schools, at their homes, in their communities. Nafisa, uh, welcome and please uh, tell us a little bit about the organization you represent, the Bakai Ranch, and the recovery services that you provide. Hi, I'm Nafisa. I am the supervisor for the Somali Outreach Program at the Bakai Ranch. You guys can hear me, right? Um, I'm the first Somali supervisor um, for the program. Um, 
So I have my master's in social work, and I work at Buckeye Ranch as a multi-systematic therapy for delinquent kids, and then I left, I came back. Um, they say the grass is not greener on the other side. So I came back. Um, what we do, the Buckeye Ranch is, it's been here for over 60 years plus, right? And we have... Just like Jabril said, we have so many programs that focus mental health and substance abuse. Now, we partner up with children and we are building um, like a crisis, like a step down, because what children find out is when people, when kids get um, like hospitalized and then after that they send them home, kids are coming back. So they say we need like in the middle. So they, can, they build in um, a big kind of like a step-down hospital, uh, Grove City, where kids will stay like four weeks, six weeks. Um, and we do a lot of foster parenting, foster licensing, kinship, we partner with children's services. So my program is only focused with the Somali. We serve only Somali. If you speak Somali, um, if you speak my Mai, they will refer to us. I have a team of eight, and hopefully we grow. Um, my team are qualified mental health specialists. They get qualified, they go through training, and they provide services. Then I do the clinical supervision, give feedback, how to kind of target um, what the issue is. Um, we partner up with a lot of schools, like Horizon. We run in a whole class of mental health. Um, we here at Focus as well. Last year we did really good. We are a lot of Westside Sullivan, the schools that have majority of Somali. Um, we focus, we do mental health. Um, in the Somali community, we know that a lot of parents have a lot of kids or they're busy. Like mom and dad are working, so there's not that relationship building. So we teach these kids relationship, like hygiene, bullying, um, just mental health, like how to talk to a professional, how to talk to their parents if they're going through a lot. We have a lot of ADHD, autism in our um, community, and there's a stigma to it, right? So what we do is we go different agencies, we go, you know, talk to parents, we, talk, we tell the teachers, like, if you see symptoms of, like, mental health, talk to the parent and then I, Nafisa, will call and explain in Somali. And 99%, they will understand because they trust a Somali person, you know. So they're like, oh, okay, for medication management, there's a lot of stigma about it. But when we explain it, this kid will not be on ADHD medication forever, right? They kind of understand that we're Somali, we're Muslim, we're not going to hurt the kid. So we have a lot of successful cases. I don't know if you guys seen it. On Columbus Dispatch, we have a kid. Um, um, if you put like Somali mental health with Buckeye Ranch, you will find it. It's a good story. Um, how um, some of the questions I see is what specific barriers do African American face? A lot of times, there's stigma or um, over medicating, right? Like let's diagnose and give them medication, um, and that's where the trust comes with, you know, black, right? We don't trust the system because we think okay, we've been. Um, like over diagnosing, they want to make us like dummies, right? Um, sorry, excuse my language. But that's a lot of things I see. Um, so I also work at OSU Addiction Residential and uh, Detox. So a lot of times there's a culture gap. I think that if every agency, if they don't have someone that, um, look like the person they serve in, try to get it, right? right? DEI, right? Diversity really makes, um, also if you do not have someone that look like them, get the right interpreter. And when the person interpreting really look, are they really translating more than what you're telling them? Because there's like a misinterpretation uh, where people are di getting diagnosed. I know a lot of Somali moms, my mom has so many friends, they got prescribed for gabapentin. Why? Gabapentin is an addiction. It's an addicted drug, unless you need it. And I see so many, like elders, I'm talking about 60 plus, getting that. So they come to me. I go to my mom's house every day. They walk there. I look at their medication. If I see gabapentin, I'll be like, what's your pain? I'm not a doctor, but I've seen a lot of Somali families that are being prescribed that. And that can be so addicted. Okay, our uh, next speaker is Dorothy Hassan. Dr. Dorothy Hassan is the executive director of our helpers. 
And the question is, what specific barriers do African immigrants face when accessing recovery services? Okay. okay. Relatability. What, um, how long are these recovery programs that we are offering families? How much of a time investment are we assuming that families have to take away again from providing income and being present for their families. So you want to think again about the relatability, the relatability to the circumstances that immigrant and refugee families are facing. Religiosity. This melanin comes with faith. That's all to it. You cannot, you can't escape that. Africans are believers. We know that it is not us who makes everything happen. So you must acknowledge that when you are offering a step of recovery to African immigrants, okay? When we talk about that again, I hate when people talk about Africa as if it's Ohio. We're talking about a whole continent, folks. We're talking about a whole population um, that is diverse in itself. So when I talk about religiosity, I'm not just talking about Islam. I'm not just talking about Christianity. I'm talking about the acknowledgement of a higher power and people that are faith-based. Okay? Resources. Again, I'm not going to echo the same um, voice that we keep hearing of that you, if you just don't know, you don't know. And that is part of, when we talk about systematic racism, that was always part of the plan, to make sure that we didn't know. You cannot access what you don't know. So we have to be a part of changing that narrative. Decide your own capacity and how you're going to share information. If you are going to be the TikToker, the Instagrammer, where you're sharing information that way, welcome. If you are going to actually forward emails to people, welcome. If you are going to be the person who shows up to council meetings, um, you're showing up to different events like this one and offering neighbors and friends and other people in your congregation to ride with you, welcome. But make a decision and promise yourself that you are going to be part of changing the narrative and sharing the information. The last one, um, we said relatability, religiosity, resources, and representation. The table, the menu, we, we, we have to change that narrative, of course. And how do we do that, though? because we talk a lot about the table, how do we get more people to the table? I am always very, very adamant about telling young and old people is that no one is going to invite you to the table if you are not qualified. You're not gonna be invited anywhere just because you're black. You're not. Even though we talk a lot about tokenism, you still have to be overqualified to be tokenized to be invited to that table. When Dr. Duale was doing her, um, her introductions, she said Dr. So-and-so, she said Dr. So-and-so, she said Dr. So-and-so. That is how you get to the table. A personal story, I remember when I first started my dissertation process and I had a meeting with one of the committee heads and it was an older white doctor and he asked me, why do you want to get a PhD? And I said, because I have a lot to say. I know the value in what I have to say, but I also know that no one will listen to me until I put three, three letters behind my name. Put the work in, folks. Put the work in. Show up. Go to school. Kausar <laughs> Mose with the heart of Ohio Health Centers, who connects people with resources. She works with uh, people who have no medical insurance, signing them up, people with been diagnosed with HIV AIDS, people um, suffering from chronic Ill other chronic illnesses. Uh, we would like to hear from Kausar. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. I'm not a great speaker like Dr. 
Tori, so please excuse me. <laughs> I supposed to speak af before she speak, but she, she already said everything. But um, first, I will say a few things. Uh, my name is Kauther Musa, and as Dr. Professor Jabril mentioned, um, I work with Heart of Ohio Family Health Center. Um, I work closely with uh, immigrant communities, uh, black communities, Hispanic, Somalis, West Africans, almost everybody. Um, what I do is uh, I connect people to the resources like health insurances, uh, housing, food, clothing. That's important, right? If you don't have uh, where to sleep, then you're going to have a mental health. If you don't have something to eat, then you're going to worry about, oh, what am I going to eat? So I try to solve it, those issues. I also do a uh, coordinate HIV program. Uh, a lot of immigrants and a lot of people who reside in the west, north side of Columbus um, has, you know, has been diagnosed with HIV. And HIV is uh, just a normal disease like hypertension, diabetes, mental health, like any other disease. So I do help with those people to connect with resources. Uh, also, I provide medication assistance program is the through Columbus Public Health, which we collaborate with Columbus Public Health. Uh, the HIV program is very, uh, you know, sensitive topic, I know, but there's a lot of mental issues that's related to, to the HIV program. So also what I do is uh, people who are suffering with HIV, I do help be connected them with mental health programs. Um, a lot of African immigrants who live in Columbus are not qualified uh, health insurance. So I help them to get enrolled in government programs, uh, which are supported by uh, Columbus Public Health uh, to pay their uh, medical bills, doctor's visit, um, counseling. So I do provide those services. Um, those are the things that I do. Um, today is a mental health month. Uh, it has been already mentioned, but uh, I want to say uh, your struggles uh, do not define you. Uh, you are not who you are today. You can be someone else tomorrow. So, um, yeah, uh, help back your community, give back the community, help yourself, help your community, and grow. Thank you so much. I would like to acknowledge a, a, a who was it? Dorothy said, go to school, get your PhDs. Our youngest PhD holder, um, a proud graduate of the Ohio State, and who got her doctoral degree from Stanford recently, and who came back to the community to teach at the Ohio State University. Nema Daher is in the room. <laughs> Round of applause for her. Um, our community is growing. We're making lots of progress, and we're very proud to see um, uh, the, the young people that are really doing good, um, people thriving in every way, people coming to help each other, to support each other, people to learn about the difficulties and challenges facing other people. Um, I think this brings us to the end of the session for today. I appreciate the time that you all gave. Um, th th thank you for coming here. Thank you for being part of this event. Thank you for um, spending the morning with us, and please give a round of applause to, uh, to yourselves. Thank you very much. Nicely. <laughs>